I don't have too much in the way of announcements because um, I figure sometime next week what we will do is discuss. Um, we'll discuss, you know, just sort of generally where you're at with the project, you know, specifically on deliverables, what it is you want to do, uh, you know, with your alternatives, et cetera, et cetera. But um, before we do that, I do want to finish this discussion of loads because whether you go with a steel bridge or a concrete bridge or, or, or your timber with, with, with asphalt and whatnot, as, as, the, as the joke was earlier, um, the loads stuff is, it, it applies to all bridges. So I think it's, it's worth discussing first. So today I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish this discussion on live loads, particularly with live load distribution. We'll get into an example Monday. If we end early, we'll end early. Just don't forget to keep up with the meeting minutes. I saw everybody's got week four meeting minutes and I have not um, uh, graded them yet, but I'll probably grade them probably sometime today. Um, so far, I mean, if, if your meeting minutes are anything like the meeting minutes that you've done in the past, I'm probably going to be fine with them. Again, it's, they're, they're more for your sake than they are for mine to make sure you're keeping up with your, uh, your work progress. So there's that. Um, okay, so are there any just general questions about stuff, where we're at, where we're headed? Everybody good? Everybody just burned out from, from your celebration? Okay. All right. Well, like I said, I'm going to talk about live load distribution factors, and then I'm going to sort of call it, because I don't want to get too heavy into an example anyways. Um, I'll probably be pushing it on time as it is. So. Okay. Let's talk about live load distribution. So um, in, when we're talking about live loads on a bridge, we, we mentioned a lot of that last time and how we have, um, we have our truck load, our lane load, our tandem load, and then two things. Longitudinal place them transversely. Now longitudinal placement uh, of our live load comes from the theory of influence lines, which is something I know that you all know how to employ because we did it in structural analysis and we talked about that I believe on Monday. So I assume everybody's okay with just influence lines and stuff like that in general. Everybody good? Okay. Now, that's, that's longitudinal placement. Transverse placement, that's where live load distribution factors come into play. And basically what live load distribution factors do for us is they take a three-dimensional complex structural analysis problem and turn it into something that we can do on paper. Okay? That, that's essentially what a, uh, a live load distribution factor does for us. Okay? So what this, the way they work is you take um, the moments and shears that you would obtain from a line girder analysis. And line girder analysis, again, that's just something that you would do on paper on a structural analysis homework. Like remember when that homework where we had all the shear and moment diagrams? That is a line girder analysis. Just a line, loads, bam. So we, um, we take those moments and shears from our line girder analysis and we adjust them by appropriate distribution factors. And there's Honestly, a whole suite of distribution factors that we will compute. They will be a function of, um, are we looking at interior girders or are we looking at exterior girders? Are we looking at moments or are we looking at shears? Are we looking at um, single lane loading scenarios or multiple lane loading scenarios? So there's a, there's a, you know, there's a, uh, going to be a whole suite of them that we use. And we're honestly, we're just going to take the worst case scenario. Um, but there will be separate ones for moment and shear. But the idea is that by taking those um, uh, line girder analysis results and adjusting them by a distribution factor, we would obtain you know, real life moments and shears. I mean, it, it's, it's an approximation, but, but they're much closer than just what you did uh, in class. Now, <clears throat> most of the classic structural analysis or uh, reliable distribution factors, much of the old ones, were essentially like S over 5 or S over 11 or something like that. Because girder spacing, by and large, is the most important parameter associated with live load distribution. You know, if your beams are spaced farther apart, then one beam is going to be responsible for more load than if they were close together. Like, if you had a bunch of beams that were spaced very closely together and you put a truck on it, well, that truck's going to get spread out to, to the adjacent beams. 
But if you got beams that are spaced you know, 15, 16 feet apart and you put a truck on there, well, that one majority of that effect. So girder spacing is going to be in just about every single live load distribution factor expression uh, that you do. Okay. Um, those were the old factors. They have since been improved. And I think I showed you this last time. We're looking at the correlation between, you know, what you're getting from an analysis and what you're getting from astro approximations. And before and after, the correlation uh, is much better. The equations look a little strange, um, but they are... It's, they are empirical expressions. It's basically taking boatloads of analyses and then correlating a best fit equation to them. That, that's, this is all curve fitting stuff. So, Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about how to determine um, live load distribution factors. Okay. The first step is to compute what's called a longitudinal stiffness parameter. Now, a longitudinal stiffness parameter is, is sort of a um, generalized expression of how stiff a given girder is. And what you'll see is that um, by including the modular ratio in here, whether you're dealing with a steel bridge or a concrete bridge, this is kind of the code's way of normalizing a superstructure type. For instance, your modular ratio for a concrete steel, you know, steel beam concrete deck superstructure is going to be a lot different than a uh, modular ratio for a concrete deck and a concrete beam. The, the module, where the modular ratios are different, by computing this kg, you're sort of normalizing that into one single stiffness. So it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you take the modular ratio, and, you, and it's basically, you know, I plus AD squared, right? And we all have seen that before, right? I mean, when we did our moments of inertia, you know, sum of I plus AD squared. <coughs> what we do is we take the moment of inertia of the girder. So if we were talking about a steel bridge, this would be the moment of inertia of just the steel beam by itself. And we add to that A E G squared. Now A is the cross-sectional area uh, of the girder. And E G, to give you kind of an idea, Would you agree that the centroid of that deck is somewhere about right there, right? Now, would you agree that if, if I was just looking at the steel beam by itself, would you agree that the centroid's probably somewhere about right there? Would you agree with that? This distance here that's EG. That's it. Pretty straightforward. Okay. So it's from the centroid of the deck to the centroid of the beam, that's EG. So I plus AD squared. That, that's essentially all that is. Once you get KG, you can begin to start computing distribution factors. And they're discretized based on, you know, are you looking at interior versus exterior girders? Are you looking at single lane versus multiple lane, moment versus shear, uh, et cetera? So, let me start off and look at this. So this comes directly from the code, and you all have, you know, uh, loan out copies of that. So this is from chapter four of the spec. In fact, I'm actually going to turn, I'm going to open up the spec and turn to that. Okay, all right. So I'm on page, you know, 4-33. <coughs> this is in the structural analysis chapter of the code. And what you're finding is that the code is going to spit out distribution factor equations later. Like, like for instance, um, let me skip ahead a couple pages. Okay, so these are distribution factors for moment in interior beams. So based on your cross-section type, so if you're cross-section D, here are your equations and so on and so forth. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to assess, well, what type of super, uh, superstructure am I dealing with? So if you're dealing with, you know, a steel beam, uh, concrete deck superstructure like this, you know, composite uh, superstructure, that would be cross-section A. Um, if you're dealing with, you know, a, a reinforced concrete, you know, T-beam bridge, that'd be cross-section E. See what I mean? So 
and so on and so forth. So, you know, pre-stress, that'd be cross-section, um, you know, cross-section K uh, and what have you. Make sense? Okay, so that's the first thing that you would need to do. So the example bridge that we've been doing in class, that would be cross-section A, okay? Once you do that, okay, you're going to have a series of distribution factors. And to give you kind of an idea, there's interior moment, exterior moment, interior shear, exterior shear. So what I mean by that is you're, when you compute distribution factors, you're computing distribution factors for all the beams on the inside and then the beams on the outside. So interior girders and then the exterior girders are the two on the edge. For design purposes, my advice is to just use the worst case scenario across the board, find that one beam and just use that beam everywhere. That, that, I mean, for our bridge, that's going to be pretty straightforward. Dealing with something way more complicated, don't do that. Do something, you know, treat each beam uniquely. No, no, no. And, and, and let me explain why. To skip ahead a little bit. When we compute distribution factors for exterior beams, what we're essentially doing is we're looking at the geometry of just the girders and the deck itself. And we and I'm going to talk about this in specific detail later. But we use kind of a, a, an elementary way of determining distribution factors for exterior beams. It's called the lever rule. What we do is we say, okay, here's, let me use my pen. So when we use the lever rule, what we say is, you know, here's one of my beams and here's another beam, okay? What we do is we say, okay, I'm going to assume that this is a, an internal hinge and that this is a roller. I'm going to put my truck on, on the deck, so like half the truck goes here and half the truck goes here. And I basically sum moments and I say, okay, how much does this girder need to hold up? And then that's my reaction. So it's more based on that cross-sectional deck and girder geometry. If you have a jersey barrier down the middle, you're just going to distribute that to the girders. Now, if you had four beams, I would probably just distribute it to all of them. But if you had like 12 beams, maybe just to the there or the next one's over. Does that make sense? That's a good question, though. All right. Everybody else okay with that? <clears throat> okay. So let's say you're dealing with Let's look at this section here. So what does it say? So we have concrete deck, filled grid, partially filled grid, or unfilled grid deck composite with reinforced concrete slab on steel or concrete beams, concrete T-beams, uh, T and double T sections. Th these equations are going to be very robust. They're going to be ones that are kind of probably apply to the majority of the bridges that you look at, regardless if it's a steel bridge or a concrete bridge. Okay? <coughs> so. What you would do is this. So let's take one design lane loaded. So here's our, our distribution factor for a single lane loading scenario. So 0 0.06 plus S over 14. S is always in feet. Um, S over L. S is in feet. L is your span length. So S is the girder spacing. L is the span length. This is in feet. This is the longitudinal stiffness parameter. L is your span length. And then T sub S, that's your slab thickness. Okay. So you'll basically plug and chug, and you'll get a number, okay? So let's make up something. Let's say you plug and chug, and you get a number here that's like 0 0.68. I'm making that up, okay? So say, okay? Now let's say you do them all, okay, and you find that this is the one that's the biggest number, okay? So what you would do is you would, um, you would, you know, either software or you know, basic structural analysis, determine some live load moments and shears, take those live load moments, multiply them by 0.68, and then those were the moments that you would use to define that individual girder. Okay? Does that make sense? You're taking the moments that are on the bridge and then saying, well, how much of that moment is distributed to this or that thing? And what we're going to do is just take the worst case scenario, so, you know, we'll just, you know, whichever one's the largest. Okay? Make sense? Now, some of these uh, answers might, you know, there, there might be something right off the bat that seems a little strange. You might go, well, we have to compute distribution factors for one lane loading scenarios and two or more. Wouldn't two or more, like, wouldn't that always be the worst case scenario? I mean, think about it. If I have, I mean, what's worse, having one truck on the bridge or two trucks on the bridge? I think, well, obviously two trucks. It's not necessarily the case because you, you got to remember 
bridges are three-dimensional structures. You know, if I have a bridge that looks something like this, and I have a truck right here, that's about the best you're going to get. Okay. But if I have a truck right here, you got to think about this three-dimensionally. What that's going to do is it's going to heavily load these girders, but it might serve to uplift these as well. You, you see what I mean? It might reduce the impact on some of the other girders. So what I'm getting at is putting two trucks on the bridge. Yeah, and you know, it might seem that, yeah, okay, that's going to be a worst case scenario, but this truck over here might serve to uplift. And you might find that one lane loading scenarios might be worse in some instances than two lane loading scenarios. Does that make sense? It's, it's very possible, which is why we have one design lane loaded scenarios and then two or more design. I usually call them single and multiple. So either single lane loading scenarios or multiple lane loading scenarios. Everybody okay with that? Yes. Exactly. Yes. And we'll, we're going to go through a big comprehensive example on Monday, so, so don't worry. One thing I do want to point out is this over here. So, you know, these, these equations that are in this uh, region of the table um, are applicable only within a given range. So, but let me be clear, this range is incredibly robust. Like, for instance, um, the girder spacing has to be anywhere between three and a half feet and 16 feet. That's a pretty big range, okay? The slab thickness has to be anywhere between four and a half inches and 12 inches. The span length has to be anywhere between 20 feet and 240 feet. Whichever way you shake it on this bridge, that's going to happen. Okay. The, the N sub B, what do you think N sub B is? I'm curious, what do you think N sub B is? This one. The number of beams. You have to have at least four beams. Okay. You can't, if you had a three beam bridge, this wouldn't work. But three beam bridges and two beam bridges are very rare in, in the United States, and so much so that I would say that they're honestly never really going to get built. Three beam bridges and two beam bridges are considered non-redundant or fracture critical, especially two beam bridges. Three beams, it's debatable, but four beams are fracture critical. And what fracture critical means, let me, let me, I'll get you a but what fracture critical means is the perception that if one member fails, the whole thing's going in the river. Okay? For fracture critical bridges, uh, owners, you know, like DOHs and what have you, they are subjected to increased inspection intervals any time that they're dealing with a bridge in their inventory that's considered fracture critical. So if possible, and usually that it's a, it's a big, it's not so much if possible, it's like, okay, we've got to make it happen, um, they avoid fracture critical bridges altogether. So three beam bridges, two beam bridges, you won't see that. Now that's just, an, I'll be honest, that's kind of an American philosophy. I was in Italy once and uh, we were driving on the Austrian, and there, there were two, two beam bridges all over the place because their philosophy is, you know, engineer designed it, they're taking responsibility for it. That's it. Yeah, so like a one-lane bridge on a two-lane road. Uh, we're not doing that for, that, for this. That, that's a good question. Um, you're talking, what, when I was mentioning my, my um, uh, what I was saying before, like four-beam bridges, like you won't see bridges built that are, you know, uh, less than four beams. I'm talking about newer bridges, ones that are built, like, starting today from here on out. You won't see two-beam bridges. And three beam bridges would be a, a rarity in and of themselves. Um, now, in, in your scenario, you're talking about uh, uh, a one lane bridge on a two lane road. If possible, I think we're going to try and avoid future construction of new bridges like that. You might see that bridge undergo some maintenance, you know, throughout its design life. But I, I, hopefully, I would say that when it's time to replace that bridge, they're replacing it with a two lane bridge. I would hope. I would hope. Um, 
I, I agree. I mean, there's geometric constraints that can go into it. Uh, money, maybe the road was widened and they didn't widen the bridge. I, uh, uh, yeah, you won't find it on the interstate or anything like that. You're talking about back roads. Um, Well, it's funny, I told you about that bridge I tested in Iowa where, um, you know, the county engineer out there was like, oh, this bridge gets used quite a bit. You know, and I'm thinking like Third Avenue that has thousands of vehicles across it, you know, in a given day. Or, that, that I, well, the, I, I was out there for days. The average daily traffic on that bridge was about 20, <laughs> and, and half of it was horse and buggy. In fact, apparently, um, horse and buggy traffic actually causes increased rates of deterioration on concrete decks more than vehicles do because vehicles are for the most part rubber tires whereas you know horses and buggies you're talking about steel rimmed you know wheels and 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 horses they actually chip away at the deck faster than than vehicles do i haven't researched that topic further though so well i haven't <laughs> Okay, A any questions so far? Uh, design a drawbridge. <laughs> oh, goodness. Train <laughs> track. No, do a, do a turn, uh, you know, one that lifts up and turns. Yeah, a barge bridge. Yeah, a barge structure. Just do that. <laughs> now, you need a cable stayed bridge for this one. That's what we're talking about. Any other questions? This is good stuff. All right. There, like I said, the code discretizes them based on interior, moment, shear, what have you. Okay. So, interior girders for moment, tabulated. Exterior girders for moment. If you actually look at the distribution factors, you're going to see a term that keeps popping up quite a bit. It's called the lever rule. Okay? We're going to talk about the lever rule. I already mentioned it, but we're going to talk about it a little more specifically here in a second. Some of them are going to be lever rule computations, and some of them are going to be like this. So uh, for, you know, a, a, let's say a steel bridge concrete deck, the distribution factor is basically taking the interior girder, one, the one that you computed over here, taking it and then adjusting it by some quantity. And we'll talk about what, what these terms are uh, as we get into our example. But what you'll tend to find is that there's empirical expressions, and then when the empirical expressions don't work, you use the lever rule. Okay? But the lever rule is, is primarily you're going to find is only going to be used for the exterior beams, so it's not going to be uh, too big of a deal. Okay. Um, interior girders for shear, <laughs> pretty simple. The equations are a lot easier to deal with. It's literally just a function of girder spacing, so pretty plug and chug. Exterior girders, again, lever rule for an adjustment. Okay, so L refers to span length, but it does have some different meanings. For instance, if you have a two-span bridge, a two-span indeterminate structure, and let's say the spans aren't equal. You know, we have, what, a 120-foot bridge? What if it's 40 and 80, right? So if you're doing positive bending uh, distribution factors, your L is whatever the main span is. But if you're determining negative bending distribution factors over the pier, it's the average of your two adjacent spans. So for positive bending regions, you'd use 40 and 80. But for the pier, you'd use 60. OK? Does that make sense? Again, these are empirical expressions, so they're all curve fit. Um, so just make sure you're aware of that. Uh, again, we'll, we'll look at this in more specific detail um, as we get into our examples. Lever rule. Okay. Now, the lever rule is a, an elementary approach that you use to determine distribution on mainly exterior beams. But what you do is you basically assume that the slab is a beam and it's simply supported by the, uh, the girders. And you just put the truck on the beam. Uh, on the slab according to truck placement rules and then uh, some moments. Now, do you remember me saying that I don't really care where the paint is on the road in terms of truck placement? See, I place the truck, as a structural engineer, I place the truck 
to produce the worst case scenario. Now, when we're designing exterior beams, and that's where the lever rule is primarily going to be applied, the worst case scenario for structural design purposes says that the truck tires, the wheels, are two foot from the edge of the barrier. So, for instance, if here's my, uh, if here's my, uh, let's say my concrete slab on, you know, some superstructure, these two red arrows are essentially my truck, okay? So, this is one line of wheels and this is another line of wheels. So, the magnitude of that load is like a half, because half the truck's over here and half the truck's over here. So, you know, you can think 50% of the load, 50% of the load. We place that load such that two foot from the edge of the barrier is where the first wheel goes. Now, if you remember, the, the wheel spacing on that truck was six feet, right? So two foot from the barrier and then six feet. Here's my truck. Assume a hinge here, some moments, whatever that reaction is, that is your distribution factor for, for the most part, okay? Does that make sense? Don't worry, we'll, we'll have a full-blown example explaining how that works. So far, so good. You're going to laugh, so just bear with me. For um, slab-on-beam bridges, there is another uh, uh, procedure that is required to be performed uh, called special analysis. Now, essentially, this is the same process for how you determine um, loads on pile groups for foundations. Um, This equation looks a little nasty, but let me give you just a brief idea. So, bless you. So let's say you have a pile cap. You've got a bunch of deep, deep piles going down, something like that, what have you. And you put you know, some load on it right here. That load is going to be distributed to each of these four piles, right? And essentially the way it's distributed is you have, you know, some load and then some moment. Like, I'm sure you all have done stuff like that before. Like, you, if you have an eccentric load, you can collapse that into a load and then just a bending moment. Y'all have seen that before. I know I've shown you that before, right? Okay. So, if this equation looks a little nasty, again, this is basically, it comes from, uh, from pile groups, but if you want a simpler explanation, this is P over A, M, Y over I. That, that's all this is, okay? So don't, don't let the notation or the, the math freak you out. Okay, so far? Don't worry, we'll, we'll go through this in extensive detail. Okay, now, when you perform special analysis, and this might be kind of important for later, when you perform special analysis, you perform it for the number of lanes on the bridge. But again, let me be clear, I don't care about paint on the bridge, okay? However many striped lanes there are on the bridge, it is completely immaterial to how many structural design lanes there are, okay? So here's how you determine the structural design lanes on the bridge, this is kind of important. So you take the clear roadway width, you take that, and you divide it by 12, okay? Now, let's say you got 34 ro uh, feet of roadway width, right? Now, what's 34 divided by 12? What, 2.8 something, something like that? How many lanes is that? Two. It's not three, it's two. You take the floor. You take the integer portion of that division. So, 12 foot wide, if it's 35.99999, it's two. But if it's 36, it's three. Does that make sense? Now, if you have a, um, uh, if you have like a, um, tw a really thin bridge, like 20 to 24 foot wide, just use two design lanes that are equally width. All right, makes sense. But for most scenarios, just take the clear roadway width, divide it by 12. The reason why that's important is you do special analysis for the number of lanes on the bridge. So if you had three lanes, you do it three times. So it's just something to keep in mind. Everybody good? Couple other things that are worth mentioning. One of them is called multi-presence factors. So, um, a multiple presence factor is is basically it, it's a statistical quantity that's trying to account for the probability of coincident truck loadings on the bridge. 
So um, the idea is, and I'm going to try and word this the, the best I can. Um, if you're designing a bridge, let's say you do all your distribution factor computations and you find that a single lane loading scenario works. Well, what's the probability that at any given point for worst case scenario loadings, only one lane of the bridge is seeing traffic? I'd say it's probably pretty low. So what I'm going to do is in instances where single lane loading governs, I'm going to take that distribution factor and I'm going to bump it up a little bit. But then on the flip side, well, what's the probability that four lanes are equally loaded to their extreme at the same time? Well, that's probably pretty low, so I'm going to bump that down a little bit. Um, multiple presence factors take that stuff into account. So if you have a one lane loading scenario, you would bump up your distribution factors by 20%. If you had like a three lane loaded scenario, you'd bump them down 15%, so 0.85, okay? Now the multiple presence factors have already been included. They're already built into like all these expressions here and here. So you don't have to worry about that. You only have to worry about uh, uh, multi-presence factors for the lever rule and for special analysis. Everything else, you ain't gonna worry about it. Um, okay. So a few final notes. When you're doing fatigue load distribution, fatigue is solely meant for a single lane load. Like when we do our fatigue calcs, we're only considering single lane loading. So we actually divide out the multiple presence factor for single lane loading, which is 1.2. So we're going to do that down the line. And then for deflections, we don't have a fancy distribution factor. We just take all the lanes. You know, if there's two lanes and there's four beams, two divided by four is 0.5. Adjust that by our multiple presence factor. There's our distribution factor for deflections. Th that's it. Now, I know I threw a lot of equations at you and a lot of tech. We're going to implement that on, on Monday. So don't worry if, if you're like, oh, God, how am I supposed to remember all this? Don't worry. I think you're going to find it's a, it, you know, it's a little bit of grunt work, but I think you're going to find it's pretty straightforward. This is one of those things where if you set up a spreadsheet to do this stuff, change a few parameters, and it does it for you. Okay. In fact, if you haven't already done so, it's probably a good idea to even start to set up spreadsheets to do things like your load computations. I think if you change the girder spacing, that changes all your loads, but that's what Excel's for. Everybody good? Okay, let me see what time it is. All right. I'm going to stop this and we'll, we'll call it.